I'm Tom Power. This is Toy Heart, a podcast about bluegrass. Hello from St. John's, Newfoundland in Canada. I hope you're holding up all right. Uh, As I mentioned a little while ago, we'd be holding off on doing new episodes of Toy Heart until the border opens back up and I get the chance to go down and chat face to face with bluegrass musicians. And that might be a ways away, but we were okay with it until news came out that a true legend of the music, Tony Rice, had died. He was 69. The news came in around Christmas Day, and it was a complete shock to the bluegrass community. Here was this titan of the music, someone who had made more impact on bluegrass music than anyone, perhaps since Bill Monroe and Earl Scruggs, who had inspired countless musicians and bands and changed the way the music sounded. But one thing kept coming up in the conversation around Tony. Who was he? He seemed like this mysterious figure who came out of the shadows in a perfect suit to play jaw-dropping guitar and sing in a way that every song he picked out became a song everyone else had to learn. But again, who was he? So over the next three weeks and the next three episodes, we're going to try and answer that question by talking to folks that he came up with in music, talking to folks he toured and recorded with, and talking to folks he mentored and influenced. Our tribute to the legendary Tony Rice. We have three incredible guests today, Sam Bush, David Grisman, and Jerry Douglas. All three developed their sound around Tony Rice, knew him at the earliest stages of their and his career, and all three, along with Tony, made music that would change the genre forever. We'll start things off with Sam Bush, who played with Tony in one of his earliest bands, the Bluegrass Alliance. We've been looking forward to talking to Sam forever. Um, here's my conversation with Sam Bush, who we reached by phone in Florida. Sam Bush, thank you so much for, for making the time for us. My pleasure, Tom. Glad to, glad to talk today. I'm, I'm, I'll start out by saying I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss. Well, thank you. It's, uh, I mean, heck, it's the music world's loss. It's, uh, you know, of course, tragic for him, Tony Rice's family and um, all his loved ones. But he's got a, a whole bunch of us out there that really love him, that do love him. And uh, thanks. It's but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a loss. And uh, some might say, and I'm one of them, that you know is arguably one of the most influential guitar players the last 50 years. There's a a whole uh, wealth of Tony's uh, playing that uh, young guitarists are going to enjoy for a long time. When did you first know about him? Like even before you met him, when did you first know that Tony Rice kind of existed? <laughs> well, I never do any, I never heard of him, <laughs> never do him. Um, it all goes, our meeting took place and uh, we both remember the day, September 4, 1970. I had recently joined the Bluegrass Alliance to replace Dan Crary on guitar. And uh, in that, there was already a mandolin player in place. And Dan was leaving on guitar. And so I was fresh out of high school and I was going to go to college. And all of a sudden was offered a a job playing guitar five nights a week, as opposed to being a busboy working my way through college. (laughs) So I went to bluegrass college. (laughs) I started playing five nights a week. And uh, so we, uh, we, the bluegrass Alliance uh, were in bars, I think it was around, uh, excuse me, August 70. And uh, I was as a new member of the band, I was going to festivals with them, even though Dan Crary had to finish out a few commitments. So I would play mandolin at those festivals and just be the extra guy. And um, we were in Reedsville, North Carolina, Camp Springs, uh, outside Reedsville, excuse me, Camp Springs, North Carolina, and uh, Carlton Haney's Labor Day weekend festival playing. And a friend of mine, John Caparacas, said, there's a guy sitting over in the field playing like Clarence White. I said, really? So we go over there and see the world's skinniest man sitting on one of those <laughs> bluish Martin Unipack cases uh, playing someone's brand new D45. And uh, and he did play like Clarence White, pretty knocked out. And uh, so we, we struck up a conversation. Me, I was 18 years old and he was 19. And uh, I was pretty, you know, I, yeah, I never, I never you know, heard anybody play in real life like Clarence White, except Clarence White. And so he, um, we, we, you know, we, I guess we played a little bit. And so this is when I found out the youngest guy in the band should not 
who's only been in it about six weeks should not be asking someone else to join the band without talking to the other guys. So, but I just, uh, you know, immediately told him, Hey man, you, you come back, join our band. I can play mandolin block. Cause he had seen me play mandolin on, on the stage. So he knew who I was, but we hadn't met. And, uh, so anyhow, uh, then I go back to campsite and tell the guys, Hey, I just got this great guitar player to join the band, which I was met with. Holy wrath of what <laughs> you don't get to do that junior and then uh but he came over to the uh campground where we were and we jammed for a while and he was uh tony was a few days later living in louisville kentucky playing with us so that's that's how we met i had not heard of him uh i knew of his brother uh larry on manlin i knew larry rice and uh, larry you know was originally on a group uh, of record i owned uh already called Aunt Dinah's Quilting Party from California. And then, lo and behold, he joined J.D. Crow's band. And, and uh, so that, I knew of Larry, and uh, but not Tony. So that's how we met. And, and uh, <laughs> we met, and a few days later, we were bandmates. Yeah, and, and something pretty special there. You know, I was actually listening to a couple of old Bluegrass Alliance bootlegs, you know, kind of tape recordings that I had found on, on YouTube and stuff like that, you know. And, and you guys are, are kids. You guys are pretty young there. But, you know, you guys are, are locking in right there. You know, there, there's obviously a synchronicity happening between you guys kind of right off the bat. Well, we locked in pretty well. And, uh, and, and then in no time after Tony joined the Bluegrass Alliance, uh, Within probably a month, Courtney Johnson came on board on banjo, and the three of us had a really good groove together, I think, and uh, and we had a good trio singing. Courtney was a very good harmony singer, so uh, with, there'd be some trios uh, the three of us would sing. And uh, but Tony and I, he, we locked in. Yeah, it was. Uh, and looking back, you know, if we we were we were in such a formative years. Then once he went on with J.D. Crow, he he his style and guitar playing became more defined through the guidance of JD probably. And then once he went on with uh, David Grisman, that was a whole new experimental thing. He really grew a lot as, as a musician and guitarist when he moved to California and he and David started their musical association. And it wasn't long before, you know, he was ready to make his records too and just keep that, keep that ball rolling. Um, I have a bunch of questions for you, but I'm hung up now on, I've been asking people what it was like to be on the road with Tony Rice and people have been telling me pretty amazing stories. You were his roommate. Like I can only imagine what it was like. <laughs> well, I mean, we were just kids and, and, and you know, of course, with, when you're in the moment at that time, you don't think of yourself, I'm just a kid. We were adults. We were, we were out on our own, you know, we were getting to play music for a living. Uh, there was a great street scene down on Washington Street in in uh, Louisville, and that there was in that there were many bars, and there was a you know a band right down the street from us where this great electric guitar player named Tim Crackle played. And Tony loved Tim's playing, so we'd go down and hear all that. So we, our minds were really open to everything uh, at the time. Uh, <laughs> Tony, yeah, we had we had some funny times. I mean, just. <laughs> Something I thought of the other day was uh, when we we were sitting around watching TV one afternoon. I went back by the bathroom. I don't know if I can even make it now. I used to be able to make this noise. <laughs> like a drip. Like a drip. So I go in the bathroom and do that a couple of times, and I see his head cocks up like a little you know, cocker spaniel or something, and he goes in the bathroom, tightens them all down, tight. <laughs> chuckles the toilet <laughs> and he sits down again and I go back and hit the, hit the drop a few more times. Now he goes in the kitchen and twists the knobs off of that sink, trying to get it to stop it. <laughs> Finally looked around and caught me. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it's just dumb stuff like that. I, you know, am now thinking of, and, um, uh, you know, it's, um, we always stay close and we tried to talk on, uh, we tried to always talk on September 4. Yeah, on the that day was our anniversary. The guy you guys had met. Really, you guys kind of kept it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we didn't the last couple of years. But one or one or the other of us would call the other one. And, uh, and Tony got where he wasn't. He wasn't communicating a lot with people. And uh, so we, we kind of could only reach him by text. Right. Okay. And um, at any rate, uh, but yeah, we, we, we were... We had funny times, and then of course we stayed in touch when he went on the road. When he went with J.D. Crow, 
And uh, so we always stayed in touch. And they're one of the happiest, one of the, a really happy snapshot I have in a musical life is uh, once when uh, wasn't too happy for Larry. Larry Rice needed some surgery to remove a cyst from his wrist. And, and it was pretty intensive. He had to be hospitalized. So for two weeks, I filled in for Larry with the J.D. Crow band after Tony you know, was in it. And uh, and and we didn't uh, and it, oh, five nights a week at the, you know, at the bar in Lexington, the Red Slipper Lounge. And um, it was so fun. I mean, to get to be a member of J.D. Crow's band for, for two weeks and uh, with Tony on guitar and Bobby Sloan on bass. And at the time. Uh, the band was plugging in their instruments because Crow was, you know, influenced by the Osborne brothers to plug in and be heard and be loud. And uh, gosh, when you hear, so I got to hear Tony play, you know, with a pickup on his guitar when, when he took a solo, man, you could just, it just blast it, right? It was loud. I loved it. And, uh, and I didn't have a pickup on my mandolin yet. I actually played Larry's for two weeks. He had one on his, obviously. So, and that was in the same thing. You know, I, I spent the whole time with Tony. We'd sit up all night, listen to John Coltrane, what have you, and um, Wes Montgomery. And then we'd, uh, you know, go to sleep about four or five in the morning. You get up about, you know, one or two in the afternoon, kind of get ready to go to work after a while. So that's kind of what it was. Do it again. Uh, it was, but it was so much fun because I, you know, I got to tell you, when, when J.D. Crow goes into train 45, it is the moment of truth. Oh, Man. boy. <laughs> Did you, can you talk to me a little bit about, about making Manzanita? Yeah. Uh, well, Manzanita, I'm, I'm trying to remember. My, my mind has been blanking a little bit lately. If it was 77 or 78 when we cut the record. It came out in 79, uh, so... Okay, so it must have been seventy eight. Yeah. And uh but it was just uh it, you know, Tony had been in the Grisman uh quintet for a while now and was, but I guess he, you know, he was ready to sing and uh but he wanted to make a bluegrass record but without a banjo because now he'd gotten used to the space within David's band of no banjo. And uh and in Tony's words, and when you got flux on the Dobro, that that fills the, that forward role need. And, uh, so you had, you had a finger picking motion of Jerry Douglas. And, uh, so we, Tony assembled us all out there in California. And even though I knew Jerry before that and Ricky, uh, I, and Ricky and I, you know, of course, Ricky didn't know that I was a kid standing over on the sidelines a couple of years older than him watching him play when he was like seven or eight. And, uh, you know, so we, we later became friends and, uh, but it, it was through Manzanita is the first time I actually ever played with Ricky or, t or, uh, Jerry. And of course, Todd Phillips, I just met him. He was from California. So, but it was just a very joyful time because, you know, we said, we, we helped arrange some of those tunes. Uh, of course, Tony had a pretty definite idea what he wanted. And, uh, and by the way, Tony, played and sang all his parts on the spot on that record. He, you know, the way you hear them is the way we laid those tracks down. And there was no extra cuts where you edited part of one song and onto the end of another one or something. None of that. No, man, Tony was uh, really on his game then, and really a hoss. And, what, uh, what, what made that so special, Sam? Like, what do you think made that record so special? Uh... Well, I think it's just that, uh, well, it, it came from a love of bluegrass music for people that were becoming progressive musicians. And uh, so, you know, when, like, what's this one song, for instance, I Hope You've Learned, that was, you know, a duet with Tony and Ricky. And was, I guess it was, I think guess it was a duet originally with Jimmy Martin and Bill Monroe. Uh -huh. And, uh, and so they, in some ways we wanted to do it, you know, to make sure we had the whole flavor of the original bluegrass version, but kind of make it, make it our own too. Um, so, you know, the, re the incredible respect for bluegrass music amongst the musicians, and that's, that's our common denominator. But, uh, you know, I had the pleasure of playing mandolin and fiddle. So in some cuts, uh, Grisman played on a couple and I was on fiddle. And then there was actually a few times we recorded. We didn't we didn't like cut it all in one space. I think we did it in two or three trips out to the West Coast. And you'd cut about four or five songs. Seemed, I know I know we didn't just sit and cut the whole thing, you know, all at once. And then Ricky 
was in L.A. working on a record. <laughs> so sometimes we there were a couple. There was one session we cut with just the four of us, and uh, and I guess one of those could have been the Manzanita session because Tony brought, asked Daryl Anger to play uh, on Manzanita, and so. But the, we, the way I remember it, we we worked up Manzanita that morning, Tony and I, and uh, worked up our our instrumental trades together. And uh, we cut it that day, I believe. It sounds like he found like and why that was, he wanted and that to was my first time to. Yeah, and that was my first time to play with Daryl. Also, so yeah. really, I mean, I got to meet all these California guys, and it was just a, it was always a joyful time. And then uh, Tony had me come out for I don't know how many more records, uh, acoustics, uh, Mar West, and I guess Cold on the Shoulder. Uh, and you know, they'd always be just the most joyful times. Cause you know, Tony and I were, uh, uh, you know, give us a chance to just reacquaint and hang his pals, make coffee together, laugh at each other. <laughs> One time I was out there and, um, out there being the West coast and, uh, Tony and I were riding around. He, he had this car and the car's name was space grass. <laughs> we were riding in space grass around the Bay area. And then all of a sudden, then we're listening to jazz on the radio and, uh, and, uh, night, wonderful day. And, um, all of a sudden we get stopped in a traffic jam on the, uh, Golden Gate bridge. And, uh, all of a sudden emergency comes on the radio. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, an earthquake was hitting the area, and if you're on a bridge, exit the bridge now. <laughs> we we kind of looked at each other because okay, I can't remember what he said. He, oh, I think he said, "Oh, it's all over now, baby blue." <laughs> <laughs> we, and and we never maybe because we were sitting on a suspension bridge, we never felt you know anything. And apparently, it was it was like a you know. Healthy earthquake was hit right then. So we, <laughs> man, oh man, he, he, like it seems like even though you went on to, to have such amazing success with Newgrass and then on your own with Amy Lou and then Tony went off to start the unit and you know and, and play with Grisman, huh? you guys continued. Like I always, my entire life of loving bluegrass music, I always saw you guys as in the same world. Like you seemed, it must have been so nice yeah. to every to like a couple of times a year just get together for a jam or a Merle Fest or something like that. You guys still played an awful lot, even not on each other's records, you know? Yeah, we did. And uh well, I mean that's just a and it happens, you know, there's a certain ones of us that if we get together, it's like we never left. You know, when I get to play with Jerry or Bela or Edgar or Tony, um, Stuart Duncan, uh, same thing. And, uh, and, and Brian Sutton. And, and, uh, so, you know, it, it's, uh, it's like you never left and we could, we could meet up and could not be on hammer. Boom. Let's do it. And because, I mean, there is, you know, I, and, it, and it, it, it can't be described. It's just felt bluegrass time, bluegrass timing. And I mean, Bill Monroe, you know, talked about the bluegrass time to his guys. And there's something about that bluegrass time that when we get back together and hit it again, it just clicks. And um, so we just, there's, it always just, you know, Tony and I could sit down and play a duet, whatever. I was surprised the other day when someone sent me a, gosh, I don't know where it was. Oh, it was, I guess, a side stage set we did at Merle Fest long ago. Just Tony and me, the two of us. I had I hardly had a memory of doing it. Or the or the first three or four songs was just the two of us. And he always liked this song that I wrote when I was like seven, sixteen, seventeen, called Poor Richard's Blues, and we play that. And um but the two of us had a timing together and, and uh I, I said it uh before after his passing that uh Tony really believed he one time he, he said I, that his guitar and my mandolin were a perfect match. And that that they were uh, quote meant to be played together, <laughs> and maybe he was right. Yeah, man. But I mean, it obviously it ain't just the instruments because I've heard other people pick up Tony's guitar and that mm -mm, in his hands is when that particular guitar is special. But what what made Tony Rice's playing so special? Uh, well, because he didn't. I mean. He had the good fortune to literally be a kid, a 
little guy learning to play bluegrass and watching Clarence White right in front of him. And uh, so, the, and just because you get to stand there in front of Clarence doesn't mean that someday you're going to be able to do that. But in Tony's case, that was that. That's what happened, and he had the good fortune to be really influenced by Clarence up close as a kid. And uh, so it, you know, he it made him unique. He wasn't like the other guys. And even though he's he was kind of a southerner all in all, <laughs> he's kind of a California southerner. Uh, but, uh, you know, but he, he, he played, you know, and then again, he was smart enough to listen to Doc Watson and and know quite a lot of those kind of things too. And a lot of Clarence's syncopation, uh, sense of syncopation came from Doc Watson. Let's not, you know, forget about old Doc, but, um, but really Tony, it's, it was his right hand movement. And I, and I don't know if Clarence's right hand did that or not. But Tony sure did, and and he he developed his own thing. Why why it does it just like Tony? Yeah, he certainly does. I, I you know a lot of people have been talking about his rhythm playing, you know, and I I feel like the the progression of getting into Tony Rice is you start out by loving his you know his finger his um his his, his breaks right his solos, and then you the lead, yeah. And, yeah then you find yourself loving oh. his uh, singing. And then you find yourself loving his his rhythm playing. So, what was it like to play with Tony Rice back in Yale? Uh well, it, it really all I can go by is that it felt great when the two of us played. So he uh, it, it, when he made the runs behind you, you know, the runs that lead to the next chords, they were like, and especially back when we did it in the bluegrass. <laughs> Alliance, he, you know, he, his were like little little hammers going off, and uh, so his timing was great. So it it was wonderful. What was what was he like? Uh, well, I, I knew him as a as a you know as a buddy and a pal, and so for me, he was you know he he was a real funny guy. I think he was probably pretty guarded to people you know that he didn't know. But uh, I don't know. I know him well. <laughs> so uh, for us, we just uh, laughed a lot uh, over the years, you know. So so he had a great sense of humor, and, and we he I mean, you know when when he was passionate about something, he was really passionate about something. So later in life, he got really enthused about watch repair. He loved to re- he loved to repair watches. And especially what's the ones with the clear face Accutrons. Yeah. He uh, became an expert at fixing Accutrons. And, and I acquired an old Accutron from the 60s. And Tony told me once on the phone, and it never came to be. He said, and, and this watch is still in the case. It's got the papers. It's beautiful, right? And he, and he goes, don't ever let anybody except me change the battery in that. <laughs> <laughs> so. So I would have loved to have gone over for him to work on my watch someday. It just never happened. Do you guys, you guys stay in touch? We, uh, we, we would talk occasionally. Yeah, we did stay in touch. And again, we, we tried to always talk on our anniversary, September 4th, which ironically is my, my mom's birthday. So I, something was a day I could remember. And, uh, but we, I mean, we stayed in touch, but no, I, I don't, I don't mean to act like we talked every day because we didn't. And uh, um, unfortunately haven't for a couple of years. Um, So he, he, he wasn't communicating with many people, not many at all. So it's uh, the, you know, he, so, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of us, his friends, we don't really know what he was going through later in life. Other than I know that uh, arthritis and dep- depression were some were a couple things he was going through, and that's all he really ever told me. It's it's because I would ask him, "Come on, are you all right?" And uh, but that's all he ever confessed to to me. Yeah, hey, that seems to be the story we're getting from a lot of folks, Sam. You know, I was talking to Bailey. Yeah, and you know, and, yeah, yeah. That's you know. Well, I mean, again, who knows what we all go through, and. Um, I just, uh, I just always just wished him happiness. 
I, I had such a great time listening to the you guys at the Birchmere. You know, I think it was you and, and you and Tony <laughs> and Schatz and 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 Bela and yeah. and Stuart. And it's you know, not only is the music incredible, but I can hear the joy of each of you. You know, playing that music. <laughs> I mean, every once, it was, every once in a while, we, you know, we'd butt each other around a little bit over the mic. And, uh, you know, it was just all, I was playing all the time. There was this one night at the Birch Mirror where I said, I'm just obviously just horsing around, right? And everybody else on stage, we're not using them, but we all own pickups on our instruments, right? And uh, so that's my rule. If, if one guy is not plugged in, then nobody gets to plug in with, you know, we all got to plug in if we're plugging in. So, and uh, so, you, you know, of course you would never plug in playing with Tony and uh, who never had a pickup on his you know, guitar, not that one, not the Clarence white guitar. And so I'm just joshing around, you know, Hey, Tony, all, I noticed all of us got these, these little uh, pickups on our, uh, instruments, you know, so we can be loud when we need to be. Well, well, how come ain't none of that? Why don't you ever do that? <laughs> and uh, I can't go into exactly what he said because it shouldn't have been said over the mic. But he, I'm not going to put a pickup on Clarence White's guitar. <laughs> 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 and, and it was just like, wow. <laughs> And then I just stepped up to the mic and I said, well, Bill Monroe gave me this mandolin, which of course is just a lie. But I said, Bill Monroe gave me this mandolin and he would never say the F word over a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kind of fishing here now. You don't know. I, I saw a photo the other day of, of Bill and, and Tony, uh, and I didn't know they had ever, they had ever really spent any time to, together. Do you have any recollection of them? <laughs> no. Yes, I do. But, but I, I, I don't know of any relationship they had, right? Uh, but one of the funniest things I ever saw in my life was in, in, uh, in the summer of 71, we, we, the Bluegrass Alliance, were playing in Cosby, Tennessee at James Monroe's first annual Bluegrass Festival. So we'd all been playing, and, you know, and that, I, I think that was my first foray into moonshine that particular night. <laughs> but I think I'd, I'd maybe sobered up by the time we got back to the hotel, and um, um, we'd um, uh, gotten hotel, and we'd jamming around. And uh, so Tony and Jack Hicks, who was playing banjo for Monroe, they decided to go for a swim. <laughs> So we're all, again, we'd all still been drinking. Of course, Bill don't approve of none of that, Monroe. And, okay, so while Tony's gone from the hotel room, we're sitting around, and all of a sudden there's a knock on the door, and there's Monroe, his man, when he heard some picking, wanting to know if we want to play. So sure. So Bill comes in, and we're sitting there picking on these, you know, these small room, two beds, and uh, sitting on two beds facing each other. And all of a sudden, the door blasts open, and here comes Rice and Jack Hicks in the door, sopping wet. They didn't have a towel. And I just remember Tony jumping on the bed and nothing but the <laughs> trunks he had on him. <laughs> Grabbed the guitar. Play one, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, you know, Monroe played a few tunes uh, with him, but. But yeah, uh, so I, uh, that's the, I, I don't know of any relationship they would have had. I mean, uh, again, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's beautiful, man. So that one was always funny to me. And uh, Jack Hicks, his boss, went straight in the bathroom and never came out <laughs> the rest <laughs> of the time we were in that room. <laughs> Uh, man, it's, it's, I mean, I could talk to you about Tony, Tony all day. I'll, I'll ask you what I've been excited of asking asking everybody uh -huh. you know is when you when you when you picture him in your mind um when you see tony rice in your mind can you can you paint me a picture of, of what you see can you describe to me what you see uh, uh wow i really uh my mind goes back to you know what was a happy time for us two together when he'd live in california and uh as uh, I was talking about before, you know, us riding around in his car, space grass, listening to music. So it's like a harks me back to a you know a time when he was really happy. I bet, man. So that's how I picture. I mean, that's kind of how I mainly think of him. 
Uh, but you know, once he, uh, he found his direction, he wanted to be there and he was there, uh, you know, he's going to, I had never thought of the fact that until I read a quote by him just the other day, this where he said, all my heroes wore suits, Miles Davis wore a suit and this and that. And so I said, I thought, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Oh yeah. He looked great, man. He looked, he dressed to the nines. You know? Okay. But I'll, I'll, when I was a kid, I always heard if you wanted to look classy, you never put a pen and pencil in your breast pocket of your coat. <laughs> you don't, don't, you don't put anything in that pocket to look classy. And I know Tony always had his beautiful pen and pencil set up there. And I'd walk up to him and go, Hey T, you got a pen? And he, he'd pull it out, pull it out of the pocket. And I go, Oh, never mind. <laughs> I must have done it. There's no telling how many times I ever did that. <laughs> uh, man, and listen, thank you so much for your time. Any, any, anything you want to leave us with? Anything that, you know, any, any memories of Tony Rice that come to mind that we didn't, that we didn't get to that you'd like to get out or anything? Uh, oh, you know, they, 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 they're going to come pouring out in the next, you know, while now. Because I, uh, I even though he hasn't, been around any of us i mean the last time many of us saw him was 2013 at ibma that was a great time for him that weekend and uh you know i just uh when, when i think of him i you know think of him with love and uh wish him peace sam bush thank you so much my pleasure thanks tom Thank you so much to Sam Bush. I spent the weeks after Tony's passing watching so many YouTube videos and so many of them were of Tony and Sam just playing incredible music together. I really, really do appreciate Sam's time and, and stories about his his friend. Jerry Douglas is someone I was also so excited about talking to. If you're familiar with our podcast, you might know that we did a long episode with Jerry telling his story in the music. And you might remember a part of our conversation was he starts telling us how to track down and talk to Tony Rice. You know, he tells us where to go and and how to make it happen. And, you know, sadly, the pandemic happened and, and we never got to try his strategy out. But when I reached out to Jerry to see if he'd say a few words about Tony Rice, he said he'd been trying to write them down for a while, whether it's like in an article or an Instagram post or something like that. But he had a hard time writing out his feelings on a guy who was not just his friend, but in some ways his brother. So he was excited to tell a few stories. And he certainly did. Here's our conversation with Jerry Douglas. Jerry, it's nice to, nice to talk to you again. Last time we talked, we talked so much about Tony Rice. And uh, I just want to say right off the bat, I'm really sorry for you, man. I really am. You know, you, you crossed Thanks. my mind when word came out. Thanks. It, I, I lost a brother. I do. I truly did. I mean, Tony was as close to me at times, closer to me than my real brother, I would say. And uh, we weathered a lot of things together. And uh, I saw him go through tortures. I saw him go through the like really high points, you know, the full spectrum. I mean, I, I was there for a lot of the recording and even visited. I would, <laughs> I would go out to California if I was going to record with him or Grisman. I would go out a couple days early just so I could get used to the pot. <laughs> Grisman's pot was just like, you know, if you didn't smoke, if you waited till you got in the studio and he handed it to you and you hit it, you were going to curl up in a ball. Your your next solo was going to be indistinguishable. You know, it, you can you can. Um, <laughs> so I would go out and hang out with Tony, and go to the house. He would pick me up in his car. He had he had a GTX, a Plymouth GTX, um, uh, and it was he it was named. He called it Space Grass. Had a little, he had one of those Dynac, the Dynac comp, one of those things you can make little sentences, you know, and tap them out and then stick them on things, Dynatake. And uh, right on the dashboard said Space Grass. Fantastic. You know? It was the name of the car and the name of the music. And he's just a funny guy like that. I, I remember uh, when I first started playing with him with Crow, with JD Crow, I would go over it wait wait for uh tony to wake up at like five o'clock in the evening and uh hang out just hang out go with him take his wife to work 
<laughs> and then we just hang out. And uh, at that point, they had, we'd stopped playing the Holiday Inn every night. You know, that was over and we were a band. We were a traveling band that summer. And I'd go and hang out with him. And then we, you know, he'd have breakfast at five, five o'clock in the evening. And then, uh, then we would just sit and listen to Coltrane, Miles, Eric Dolphy, you know, Tony wanted to be, I think really Tony, Tony wanted to live the jazz life. Right. Yeah. He, he was, he was more than a bluegrass player. I mean, the things he did for bluegrass are now the book of what to do with bluegrass guitar. I mean, it's the, it's the Bible. It's the guitar Bible. And, uh, but nobody ever will do it like he did it. No. What's your, what's your earliest memory of just knowing about him? Like knowing that he existed? Um, well, Ricky had Ricky Skaggs and I were in, in a band called the country gentleman. And I was 17, I guess, 18. Ricky was 19. Tony would have been 22. And uh, I heard about him through Ricky and then we played a festival, a freezing cold festival in in, uh, lo- in in southern Ohio in October, and it snowed. But I saw Tony play with Crow that day, and that's the first time I can remember seeing him play and striking up a conversation with him. And then he did his first record not long after that, and I played on well, I played on California Autumn, and maybe he already had guitar was already out. I think that was a name of his record. I didn't even know about that record until a couple of years ago, but I just heard about him. I heard like, there's this guy that, that he, he, uh, he zoomed off from doc Watson and his mentor, Clarence white. He zoomed off from them a while back. You know, he's been playing in this club six nights a week and he's just like Arnold Schwarzenegger of the guitar. At this point. <laughs> <laughs> he had muscles everywhere in his hand, you know, it was strange, strange to have them. And, but he had, he had, uh, he had connected, he had connected all these different influences and he was playing in a bluegrass band and just running them out there once in a while. And it just would just floor an audience. The things he could do, they'd never heard anything like that before. I'd never heard anything like that before. And so we got, I mean, we're close enough in age. He and Ricky and I kind of like bound, uh, bonded together. And so I got to record with him. Then when he came in and John Starling was sort of uh, producing. And uh, I talked to his son, Jay, the other day. And Jay was just in pieces about this. And so Jay, Jay Starling and, and Critter uh, were both, their fathers were in, that's seldom seen. So Tony was around and Tony was even uh, the possible replacement for John Starling, you know, when he quit. And, but Tony, Tony didn't do it. Tony had by that time had another thing going and he would have had to relinquish some tools of his, you know, in his toolbox to play with them. And uh, I think Tony just thought, I'll just go on with what I'm doing. I like what I'm doing. So he, he kept that, but he, he kept these great friendships with John Duffy and Justin Starling and all those guys in that band. That would have been a great move for him, but it was bluegrass again. And he didn't want it. He didn't want to yeah. do that. What, what do you remember about Tony and making the, the big crow album? What do you remember about Tony in that? Cause you, you got, you were telling me you got brought in sort of surreptitiously, right? Yeah. But I was, I was a kid, you know, and I was, I was really anxious to get involved in that. I mean, I was coming in for like to play on maybe two songs. They had talked Crow into letting this kid play Dobro on two songs. So I ended up playing on eight or nine. But I remember going to this Holiday Inn in um, Tacoma or Silver Springs, Maryland, because we recorded the, the record at Track Studios, which is, I don't know if it's still there. It may still be there. But I remember going to breakfast with him that morning and Tony had just cut his thumb with a knife, his, his uh, right thumb to hold a pick with. He cut it deep and it been, it was all bandaged up and everything. So this whole record, he was playing like lame, 
you know, not, not playing lame, but he was lamed. Uh, and, but I went to breakfast and I watched Tony. I always watched Tony. I mean, I was always kind of looking at him like an older brother, I suppose. And I watched Tony order water, coffee, milk, orange juice, maybe tomato juice and bacon and eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, this guy's going to be floating. We'll never get the record. Anything done. <laughs> but it was just a Tony did things. Uh, Tony was, you know, he, he was, he had a different drummer and uh, he just did it. You know, what it, it, there was no filter. He just, from his mind to like ordering food, he just ordered and it was very unorthodox, but he just did it. He did a lot of things that way. And uh, I don't know, just the way his mind worked, I suppose. Now, Tony, Tony and Crow seem to have a really good relationship. Hey, like Tony had a great respect for JD Crow. That was it. That was it. And and JD thought Tony was nuts. But uh, <laughs> but <laughs> come on, kid, you know <laughs> yeah. that kind of thing. JD knew so much, and his name was in big letters. <laughs> <laughs> so what? How did you react when Tony? left to go play with Grisman. Really, like, I was saying, I was saying to Dog, I was saying, like, really, Tony's story is pre-Grisman and post-Grisman in so many ways. So how did you react when he went out there, you know? I was heartbroken at first when I first found out about it. You know, I hadn't been in this band very long, and we had, we were like the Beatles of bluegrass already, you know, just by making that record. And we did the tour of festivals that summer, and everywhere we went, you know, it was, I'd never been in that kind of situation before where people were just clamoring for us and wouldn't leave us alone. But when I found out Tony was going to go play with Grisman, I thought, well, it certainly makes sense and it's going to be a great thing. But I, I you know, my pain came from, well, I guess I'm not going to get to play anymore with Tony. Right. And so when I went out, like saying, like when I went out a couple of days early, you know, to hang out, to record, Anytime when I started going to to the rehearsals of the the quintet, the original quintet, when they were rehearsing, and I told David the other day the the one rehearsal I really remember was they were rehearsing a song called Thailand that David had written, and it was huge epic tune, you know, like fifteen minutes long. It had all these different intersecting parts. And they were rehearsing, just putting the one part at a time and putting these things together. But at one point, <laughs> Tony hadn't been out there very long. He didn't really know his way around. And we were at Grisman's house and and uh, <laughs> Tony said, hey, David, I'm out of cigarettes and I don't know where the store is. And, and Grisman said, hey, man, smoke this. You'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> And that was just how they, that was how they communicated. It was just, everything was funny until the music started and then it got really serious. And I thought I've never heard anything like this before. Nobody's ever heard anything like this before. And I wish I could play this, but I know I can't right now, but I'm going to learn. I'm going to know someday I'll be able to play all of this. And, uh, you know, I was, I was really learning and I was soaking things up from Tony and, like a sponge and JD, you were, hey, like you and you and Tony would sit down and, and, you know, we didn't play. We didn't sit down and play. We sit down and talked about it. Yeah. We, that seemed we, to be his yeah. way. Hey, like to talk about that music was, and listen to music. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was learning as much as I could from, uh, from Tony and from JD, Ricky and I had been, you know, together in this other band for a while. And, uh, We'd been just woodshedding Grappelli and Reinhardt records for two years. So we had kind of a jump on what Tony was doing, but we had to bring bring it down a little bit to play just play bluegrass, make it recognizable, make it really be bluegrass. With Crow, that was easy because you have this driving banjo and he he's just driving it up your ass and you've got no place to go. And it was that's what I learned from Crow was like timing. Tuning, timing, and just drive, you know, just the, what drive really meant. It was an attitude. It wasn't how hard you played. It was the attitude that you played with. 
and you had a little swagger in your playing and and but it was still like like a clock you know it was like a piston right and um if you watch tony standing on stage he was always standing straight he's not there's not a lot of movement in the guy and and all that movement was happening like right here you know and in between his finger his index finger and his thumb and once in a while maybe it's his ring finger on his right hand to just grace something, a grace note here and there, but not often meaning that's, that's kind of what did his wrist. That's kind of what did his brought the, the arthritis on, yeah. you know, like on just because he played like that, but he was weaving, you know, he wasn't like down, 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 up, 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 you know, or down, up, down, up, you know, that it, he was going between strings. He was like doing, Jesse, Mc, Jesse McReynolds cross picking all the time, and uh, and but he his hands knew what they were doing. I mean, and they were totally in tune with each other at all times. T- talk to me about making making Manzanita with him. I mean, because it's it's an interesting thing, right? You know, like he goes, he plays with Crow, playing bluegrass. He goes to Grisman, plays pretty wild out there stuff, and then makes without a banjo, so no Crow, and makes sort of a folk bluegrass progressive music kind of crossover record that still is holds up as one of the best ever, you know? Well, I think he, he thought about that. He thought about making a record that would, would entail all the things that he was doing. There was no banjo involved in his music at that point. And Dobro replaced that because I could, I could play behind his vocals too. I could be another voice behind his vocals. And I was learning, you know, from the whites, I had was going to later on learn a whole lot more about backing vocals, but I learned a lot about him, about staying out of the way of the vocals and and that kind. Of, but but we did that record. And we started off the first couple of days was just Todd, Tony, uh, Sam, and myself. Ricky was in Ricky was in Hollywood with Emmy Lou and. And Dolly and uh, the first one of those those trio records, Linda Ronstadt. And he was down there and, uh, you know, that record never came out because of all of them, you know, the infighting between the labels and the lawyers and everything. But Ricky, Ricky arrived on our scene with this whole like, oh, we have to we have to write out the arrangements. We have to we have to live by them, you know. And before that, we were just like playing, you know. Yeah, isn't that kind of how Tony is? Isn't Tony just kind of playing? Yeah, he never told he never told me ever. You back here, you here's your solo. We'd be running down a tune, and he would just kind of look up at you and go, and you deliver. And plus, we knew when to back up each other, and we were looking. There was a lot of eye contact going on. We weren't all baffled off and and uh, and couldn't see each other or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> um, so we were, we had a lot of eye contact and that made, that made a, everything really easy. Ricky came and we had suddenly had to, to write out the arrangements and, and rehearse. Yeah. And, uh, we weren't, we, we weren't rehearsing. We were just playing and, and it sounded great. And it was just going down. It was one entity, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't you do this and here and you do this here and, you know, like when it when it when you write it out, it it becomes unmusical suddenly, or it did that in that situation. Yeah. But we but we uh, we uh, soldiered on, and the record's great. And and there were a lot of things I learned. You know, I mean, to, I don't play Manzanita like that anymore. You know, I I said D minor, D minor. That's like that's going to be hard for me to 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 navigate. And Tony said, just think about it like F. So I went, okay. So the first thing I do, my D minor chord, my first D minor chord is an F. Oh yeah. And, uh, I didn't think about it anymore until like I knew better than just to play a straight F later on. But Tony was like, cool. That's fine. It, it's within specs. He would say. <laughs> and, um, uh, and that record came out and shocked everybody because, first of all, it didn't have a banjo on it. 
but they still liked it and they didn't know why. <laughs> so, but it, you know, why, why they liked it was because of Tony and Ricky and, and Sam and Sam played such great fiddle on that record. You know, he the and songs Ricky, were good, man. The song selection was good. You know, yeah. Jerry, I want to talk a little bit about the bluegrass album band. I want to talk about the unit. I want to talk about some stuff you did with Bela, but like, I, I, I just wanted to throw something at you. Last time when I was talking to Sam, I just happened to say, did, Tony ever meet Monroe and he told me this crazy story about Tony going swimming in his underwear and coming in soaking wet and seeing Bill you know so I thought I'd ask you like do you have any story did Tony ever meet Lester like I know Tony loved Lester did Tony ever know those guys I don't know but he never said anything about meeting Lester flat I he just had respect you know he just he wanted to be Lester Flat, when it came down to a Flat and Scruggs song, he wanted to be honest and true to the to the original performance. Yeah, but he couldn't because he was Tony Rice. You know, he couldn't <laughs> he couldn't croon like that. Yeah, he had his own style of of singing. Tony Tony changed bluegrass singing too because he 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 did take some shortcuts once in a while, but they were his. I mean, they were his shortcuts. I mean, they were as only he would sing it. Mm. And uh, so it was just sort of like he just edited the vocal, you know, and yeah. sang, here's here's how I think it goes. Yeah. And, you know, I won't go down into the Bing Crosby world and all that kind of stuff. I'll just stay, I'll be me, and I'll, and I'll mm. sing this and with as much um, emphasis and as much emotion as I can. And his voice just gave you that. Anyway, you you knew he was telling you the God's honest truth. There was there was uh, no no uh, you didn't have there was no guessing about what he was talking about. And he, and he was very articulate. You could understand what he was saying. He was yeah. like it was in that way. He was like Lester Flat, yeah. you know. But but uh, he just had such a reverence and, and respect for those old songs. But he wanted to do them in the way that maybe Flatt and Scruggs would have done them today. You know, I think that's what he was thinking. Like he picked Crow, he picked Doyle Lawson, um, me, uh, Bobby Hicks was the the fiddle player for those records, for the Bluegrass album band records. Yeah. It's just funny though, because, you know, he goes off and goes crazy with Grisman and then there's a world in which he stays there, you know, like, and he just pushes further and further, but it was important to him to come back to not just Bluegrass, but like, the big bluegrass songs, you know, I think he missed it. I think he missed the audience and, and the audience certainly missed him. Uh, they were all, I mean, even back then, will Tony ever come back to bluegrass? Really? You know, like, uh, yeah. So he, so I think he did that, but I think Manzanita was the first time that he came back, but he just didn't bring a banjo with it. He, he still changed it. He was holding out a little bit, but when it went, he got a little older and, there were still some things he wanted to do. And he knew that the bluegrass audience was the core of his audience was always going to be. And he had so many, he had so many more pieces in his encyclopedia, you know, that he could, that he could use that would so set him so far apart from everybody else that, you know, he, he had this whole jazz understanding and he, and, but he didn't, he didn't knock him out. He didn't like suddenly start taking a Zeke Booba solo on in, you know, Little Cabin Home on the Hill. He played a Tony Rice solo. I mean, you always expected that big, gigantic G run at the end. And it was like, that's when the crowds would just explode. You know, it was like all the stuff he did in the middle of the solos, they were all like, and then, and then when he hit the G run, he was like, Poof. Yeah, 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 you're waiting for him. You're waiting to see if he's going to land it. To me, I'm you like, know he's going is he going to land this? And then he hits the G run and it's, you know? Yeah, yeah. Somebody said, I heard somebody uh, the other day said it was an Olympic landing. You know, yeah. it was a, it was like the Olympics. Tony Rice was the Olympics. Is he going to make the water? You know, is he going <laughs> to is he, he gonna hit the water? Is he going to hit the water and how much splash is there going to be? <laughs> it's like totally clean, you know? What was he like to tour with, Jerry? He was great. He was great. I remember the first tour that I was on with him was um, Crow. We decided to do a New England tour that summer. So first, you know, just sort of to break the band in, we went up north. We were played in Vermont. We played in 
New Jersey and New York and uh, not any real major, major markets, but uh, the biggest bluegrass festivals they had in those parts. And uh, I remember wake, uh, I was riding shotgun for Tony one night and Tony just dri- was just driving, <laughs> driving, driving. Crow woke up and said, where are we? <laughs> we looked at the map and we had driven we had driven like a hundred miles the wrong way oh shit <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about mingus or something and and uh tony was smoking i was smoking too i was learning to smoke because tony smoked you know so, uh but bobby sloan would had these cigarette loads did you ever see those things they no. came in a little, they came in a little tin and they were like little little splinters little little flints and you could put them in a cigarette and take a he would take a toothpick then and tamp it way down in your cigarette and when the fire hit that thing it exploded and more than once i've seen bobby he would he could break into a pack of cigarettes and and uh and then reseal the cellophane underneath it and Uh he'd load up five or six cigarettes and you wouldn't know which ones which ones to look out for, you know, you just take the uh, Russian roulette, you know, but he would blow up Tony's cigarettes, blow up crows, sm- smoke these have a Tampa cigars that have a little wooden tip on them. And I remember crow driving one day, it got down to like, it was just like that short, you know, and like all of a sudden, woo, you know? <laughs> we could have died. Huh? Bobby was Bobby was the the prankster and the and the funny guy in the band. He was the one feeding Tony funny lines, standing behind him, you know. So, or Ricky, you know, nobody had to refeed Ricky funny hillbilly lines, you know, asking if anybody had baloney out there or anything like that. <laughs> uh, but um, I remember the strangest things. But but yeah, it, it was great. Tony and I, uh, after we played at Berryville, this really great festival in Virginia, Northern Virginia, Berryville it was a Carlton Haney festival. And, uh, it was, it, it was actually called watermelon park. And, and, and in the summertime before the festival came there, they grew watermelons in this gigantic field. And that became the parking lot campground, you know? So we, I had seen, I had seen the first incarnation of the new South or Kentucky mountain boys. I guess it was at that point when Doyle Lawson was playing guitar Larry Rice was playing mandolin, Bobby and JD. But everybody, I remember being a kid and being there and waiting for them to play because they were the Beatles then. Right, right. Just like everybody's waiting for them. They came out and just just blew the face off the whole place, you know. And when we went in there in 1975, we did that yeah. to that festival. But later on that night, Tony and I are going, man, we need let's go let's go <laughs> we drove back out to the festival from the hotel and we had this super van you know it had all this like shag carpet on the inside and captain's chairs and everything that's what we were traveling in it had these sealed beam uh fog lights that were like one hundred and twenty thousand candle power you know but tony we were out there looking for a joint <laughs> <laughs> We went back to try to get something because uh, we were too excited, you know. He was trying to trying to get down, and and uh, we were driving over these humps and you know through this watermelon field. And I remember he turned on those lights, and like everybody got out of the way. You know? <laughs> we never did find what we were looking for, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, but Tony was great to travel with. Uh, Later on, you know, when we did the ACUS tour with Tony, it was different. Tony didn't want to come on the bus because he didn't think he first he said, ah, I can't I won't be able to smoke on there. And I said, yes, you can. You can go up and sit in the buddy seat. There's a window. You smoke all you want to. Nobody will smell a thing. It's great. I'll even get you a steering wheel because he, <laughs> he wanted to he wanted to drive. And we were saying, man, some of these are 500 miles between gigs. And, uh, you know, about a third of the way through the tour, Tony wasn't showing up for, for uh, sound check anymore. <laughs> he was sleeping from the drive the night before. And it, it didn't work out so well that way. But, uh, yeah, I told him, I said, uh, you can ride the bus with us. You can lay down when you want to. And, but he didn't, he didn't sleep at night anyway. He, he never did. He, like I said, he would get up at 5 o'clock in the evening. He, 
and he'd stay up all night listening to jazz or, you know, reading or later on it became photography. Then it became uh, watches. Watch repair. Yeah. yeah. Accutron, Accutron space view watches, Boulevard Accutron space view, those in particular. Uh, And he had one on the first time I ever met him. That's what he was wearing. And I found out the, the reason he had that, that he wore that watch was John Hartford turned him on to space view watches. Wyatt told me that. Cool. And uh, or Ronnie, one of the brothers told me that. And I never knew that. I, but I thought Tony was the only one in the world that had one. He said, no, man, they, those guys, they wore these watches to space. <laughs> <laughs> Who, whose NASA. idea was bringing them out with Allison? Like, was that, was that you or was that? All of us. All of us, you know, we, we did, I remember being backstage at the Opry one night and Tony just made just a, he just was, I think he was in town recording with me or I don't know why he was in town, but um, we said, man, we should do a tour of this. And then he wasn't singing anymore. And I said, no problem. You know, we can sing it. You know, we can sing it and we can do it in the same keys. If we have to, we can, whatever we have to do. And uh, it'd be just fun, you know. We all love you so much, and we and we we want to play with you again. So, um, so he 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 accepted it, and and we were all like, "Yeah, this is good," you know. Until it started getting into those long drives, and Tony wasn't showing for sound check, and, and you know, it, it just got weirder and weirder. But uh, he would drive, he had a driver with him, with him. He had a guy that spell him, but the guy, he never let the guy drive. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, that was fun, though. Uh, and there was one funny thing that happened. We had already done the tour and uh, finished the tour. And, and then we went and played at Telluride a few months later. And... Uh, and I told Sam, I said, every night Tony plays Manzanita, but he plays, does this long intro. And I told Sam's whole band, I was standing there, I said, you guys have to see this because Tony does this long, long, he plays the whole song like three times, <laughs> you know, and just, 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 uh, you know, just free. He plays it but everybody knows what it is, but it's free. And then right at the end of it, he gets down in his guitar mic and he goes, man said, <laughs> <laughs> And then we keep, you know, and, and I told Sam about that. And I looked over, I looked, I was on the right side of the stage beside Tony. And I looked over and Sam and his whole band are standing over there in the, in, in this window. And <laughs> I stepped back so they could catch the whole thing, you know. And then when when Sa- when when Tony went down into the mic for Manzanita, I looked over and Sam. Those guys had all just disappeared. They were on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it was just stuff like that. We uh, I felt I needed to tell Sam that because Sam would get it. He would understand what Tony was up to, and uh, <laughs> the uh, stage theatrics. But you know, impeccably dressed, the yeah. pinky, the pinky ring, the 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 cologne that would stick to your clothes, just like dollies, you know. Would you guys? Did you guys stay in touch? When did you guys last talk? You know, it, we went years without talking, but um, just about a year ago, out of the blue, Tony called the house here, and I was on the road. Jill answered, talked to him for a couple of minutes. And then he, he, he got my cell phone and he called me and we talked for an hour and I'd had so many conversations with Tony over the years about, come on, Tony, you know, you need to do this to get, you need to get well, you need to do all these things. And I just decided when I got him on the phone, I, I thought, I'm not going to do any of that. I'm going to tell him I love him. I miss him. And because I don't know when I'll ever see him again, I may never see him again. And I didn't. And, um, but we just talked about everything, all the times with Crow, all the recording stuff, wives, uh, you know, all the really personal stuff to me and him. And, uh, 
it was a great conversation. He said, Pam, he said, Pam told me I better call my friend. My friends probably hate me because I don't talk to them. And he said, so I'm calling them. So he, he was trying to get a hold of Sam. I, I hope they talked. I'm not sure they ever did, but um, we had the greatest conversation and his voice was just like as clear as 1975. Really? Yeah. Yeah. If he didn't push it, if he didn't push it too hard, you know, if he, when, when he pushed too much air, the dysphonia would kick in and it would, it would just paralyze his vocal cords were gone, paralyzed. And uh, it would go into that real guttural sound that he had most of the time. But, you know, I can remember times back all the way back to where he had that voice that we'd be sitting in a hotel room. It was quiet. We were talking quietly, no TV oh, blasting over us or nothing. He had his normal voice. As long as he didn't push it, he could talk to you. And it was, it, sound, it sounded like Tony Rice's singing voice, you know? And, but as soon as he would push and that's why he couldn't sing because he couldn't push air. And uh, you couldn't gain him up, you know. I guess the guy, that, Bernie Valuti, the guy that, that got Allison so loud, could have, could, could have gotten Tony that loud, but never got the chance to. But, um, yeah, it was, it was sad. You know, when you think about it, if you're like the, such a great singer and such a great guitar player and, and your voice is taken away from you and then your guitar is taken away from you, the depression that already plagues you is going to take you to the bottom. Right. Gonna, and so I was just always wondering when we were going to get this call, you know, that Tony had taken his own life, right. you know, just because the depression got to be too much. Yeah. And he, he, he really, really, really was depressed is as long as I've known him, he, he get dark. Yeah. But on, you know, maybe bipolar at some point. I mean, because there were these other exhilaration moments, you know. Uh, but <laughs> we had great times. And uh, it's just a, piece, a big piece of my life gone, you know, with him. I, I'll tell you, and, I, I, like, what's been fun is I've been, I've been asking these questions, which seem easy. I've been asking them to everybody. They seem easy, but I think they're actually quite hard. Um, first one is just what was Tony Rice like? Well, nobody ever really knew Tony. I mean, as long as I knew Tony, I didn't know Tony. You know, I saw what he went through. Uh, you know, I saw the things that brought him down, but I, I don't know what was so deep in there that could come back, could come up and grab him so hard uh, just any time. And I know that's depression uh, and because it can come out. Of, I have it too. And it just comes out of nowhere and it just freezes you. It just freezes you. You can't, you can't even speak. And I, that happened to him on a, on a huge scale. And, and I think it did his, his entire life probably. I don't know if it was growing from growing up in a really weird Family, you know, with a dad, a hard drinking, hard working dad. Hard and love. Hard love like, hits me, man. Hits me because I know a little bit about Tony's story, you know? It's just enough, you know, just enough to to turn that into Tony's story. Yeah. Which, it, you know, it wasn't, but it became, I mean, it, it feels more like he could have written that song than anybody else I know. I know Tony struggled like the job we had Josh Williams on and Josh was telling me, you know, when he was on the road with Tony, he was, you know, he was really fucked up. You know, he was on meth and he was drinking and Tony ended up wanting to be a sponsor on the road. And he said like, Tony had gone through his own shit so much that he just wanted to fucking help him out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I went, he, he did, he did the same thing to me when I got sober. I, the first guy I went, I really, really wanted to tell was Tony because he was, he was sober and made a big deal out of it because he, he just told me, he said, I just drank enough Coors Light. I didn't need any more. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but he could quote the entire big book to you. He could just sit there and just recite it to you. And uh, he was very, very serious about that stuff. But later on, I think the depression led him into some abuse you know, of other things. 
but he didn't drink. He didn't, he, he didn't drink. He didn't need that anymore, but something, I mean, and the reason he was drinking was because of the same things, you know, just, he just clicked one off, checked, checked one box off. And we don't do that anymore. So, <laughs> but yeah, Tony, Tony became an icon and, and just became an icon to everybody and just became a caricature of that icon, you know. That's hard, yeah. man. That's hard to live up to, you know. I think that's why he never really tried to come back and play again, too, is that he he was very particular and he didn't want to come back and play under that bar that he had set. Yeah. That would be a terrible thing to him. It's just like that's worse than – that would be worse than uh, not playing at all right. would be to not to come back and have your arms feel good and your, and, you know, have your voice back and everything, but not to be able to be that Tony Rice. It seems so close. Remember when he gave that speech and he started speaking in his voice again and he said, so I watched it last night and he said something like, so hopefully with the grace of God, I might be able to sing again. Yeah, if I get in touch with my higher power. Yeah, yeah. man. Like broke my heart. That's, man. Yeah, I mean, he people were screaming "Hallelujah!" You know, "Glory to God!" All these things, and me and Ricky and Tom and uh, Sam are standing there, and we're hearing this, and we're and we're looking at each other and going, "What do we do about this?" I asked Ricky. I said, "What do we do about this?" And Ricky said, "Nothing. Right. Nothing." We're just all looking at each other, and we're going, "You know, we've been hearing him talk like." in that voice that he's delivering to them now for a long time. And maybe he had been, you know, I have no doubt he'd been working on it and trying to get it back and everything. But it was, uh, to us, it was, it, it wasn't, maybe it wasn't all on the, on, on the level, but because we knew he could speak that way if, if things got quiet enough and he could, he could muster up the courage to go ahead and, drop his voice and be quiet man when his when they heard that when they heard that they hadn't heard that you know in 40 years 50 yeah. it years. was news man it made the news yeah 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 and, there, and but we're standing back there and i i had gotten they put me in charge of putting that lineup together and i got wyatt there because i didn't know if tony could play i didn't know if he would play and i tell you what I, Wyatt was going, standing next to me going, he's going to kick it off. He's going to kick it off. I said, I said, no, God damn it. Why you're going to kick it off. That's why you're here. You kick it off. You're Tony Rice. Kick that fuck up thing off. And, and I counted it and he kicked it off. But down at the other end of that line, I heard Tony. I heard Tony. He just played rhythm and, and it raised every hair up on me because Tony Rice was back. He was, he, he was here. He was very present. And nobody makes that sound. Nobody else. Especially in rhythm, it. you know, especially in rhythm. I think. That's he told me so many times. He said, I don't care if I ever play another solo for the rest of my life. He said, I, I just want to play rhythm guitar. And nobody played him in. It's like Sam would be slamming it, you know, slamming this backbeat and, and the rest of us are playing. But Tony is all around him. It's like Sam's inside this tornado that Tony is, you know, and Tony's got like, he's subdividing like a motherfucker, you know, and, and they're all of this, that was the secret to his rhythm. He didn't play boom Chang, you know, he did, he didn't do that. It, it was like all over the place, but it was, there was a, there was a line down through the middle of it and you walked that line and uh, Todd, you know, all the bass players that he had, they were specifically picked because they could play that line. Yeah. 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 I Jack, hear him, I hear him struggling, man. Like not struggling. I don't hear him struggling, but I hear the struggle. Like Tony's yeah. way out there and I'm counting for him. I'm going like, are they going to fucking do this? Like, you know, he ain't never going to miss it. He, he's all around it, but it's, there was always this invisible line right down through the middle of it that you could just, we just channel that thing. I mean, he, He'd be playing all around you. And it was like something you never heard before. It was like a, tor like a tornado. It was like, it was just going swirling, you know, and in the middle of it is Sam and the bass notes, you know, it's like, it was a glorious thing. Did he practice? No, I think maybe he, he practiced. He didn't need a guitar to practice. He needed a guitar to get his shot hands 
you know, he'd play before the gig. Like he would talk and play before the gig. He'd be playing, constantly playing. And, you know, just back, he'd just step back from the conversation. You just, he had a thought. And, he, and uh, that's what I, that's what I gathered. I mean, he was, he was tuning up his hands to do what he needed to do. But he never, uh, no, I've never seen him just pick up the guitar out of the blue by himself and just play. Right. He pro- he may have done things like if he heard a scale, he heard something on some record, some Miles record or some, something that intrigued him and he wanted to he wanted to do incorporate it. He might sit down and figure it out on the guitar. Usually, he didn't need a guitar to figure that out. He knew where that note. He knew that where that scale was. He knew where the notes were. And he would, you know, <laughs> and, it, and that guitar too, you know, it didn't have any, any dots on it anywhere. Yeah, that was screwed people. I remember he told me a guy came up to him at the, at the end of a show and he goes, God, I love your playing. But I just got one question. How do you know where to put your fingers? <laughs> Jerry, uh, man, this is great. Before we go, can you can you do a thing? I've been asking everybody to do this too. Um, when you picture Tony Rice in your mind's eye, can you paint me a picture? Tell me what you see when you see Tony Rice in, in your mind. Uh, well, like I said before, he's impeccably dressed. He has a really nice tie. His, his hair is pulled back into a ponytail. And it's all the way down his back. And he's standing there with that guitar and he's thin as a rail. He's too thin. And he's standing there with that guitar. But when he hits that guitar, there's no doubt it can only be one person. It can only be Tony Rice. You know, I see the rings. I, I, I see that the such little movement in that right hand. You know, it's like he... but. Or, you know, or, or, and, and, and all the little things, you know, the look out of the eye, you know, it's like the directing traffic kind of thing that he did. And uh, just, you know, paint a real concentration on his face. But, you know, beautiful guy, beautiful guy. Uh, he dressed like a jazz musician. He never went on stage without a, a suit, you know, because jazz musicians don't. And he wanted he wanted to live that life. I mean, I think he was he just didn't want to do heroin. You know, that's the only thing he didn't do to be a real jazz man. But everything else was headed in that direction. But he was uh, his 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 soul was, you know, too deep in the south. And this bluegrass music was too ingrained in him. He could never leave it that, that far behind. He's a beautiful man. Jerry, thanks so much. Well, I mean, it's great to talk to you, Tom. Anytime. Nice to talk to you too. Oh, dear mother, I've heard your song, and I've been cruel to you, I know. Oh, dear mother, I'll come home some old day. Tell my brother, my sister. Thanks so much to Jerry Douglas. I feel like I could have talked to him for like another three hours. Um, it was a joy. Thanks so much to Jerry for making the time. Now, David Grisman was someone I was really looking forward to speaking with. David, or Dog, is a legend in bluegrass for sure, but also a pioneer of bringing jazz, Latin music, and funk into bluegrass, really pushing the boundaries of what the music can be. I knew that, as I said to Jerry, Tony's musical life was sort of divided into pre-Grisman and post-Grisman, but I've never met David, or at least I had never met David, So I didn't know if he'd be into talking with me about someone who meant so much to him. So I'm so grateful that David made the time from his home studio to talk about Tony Rice. David Grisman, thanks a lot for making the time for us. Thank you, Tom. Um, And I'm sorry for your I'm sorry for your loss. Yeah, well, it's uh, a big loss for us all. Uh, uh, but uh, I trust uh, Tony's in a better place. What's your earliest memory of just knowing about Tony, that Tony existed? You know, I didn't really, uh, I met Tony in 1975 
uh, because uh, Bill Keith uh, asked us both to play on his first album. And I had, you know, I was kind of at that time um, not really uh, that knowledgeable about the, at that time, contemporary bluegrass scene. I had heard the name, but I, I didn't really, I wasn't really familiar with Tony's uh, uh, playing, you know, and singing. So, so, you, so you didn't know about the Crow stuff or anything like that? That kind of missed you? Well, I guess I heard he was with J.D. Crow, but I guess that was a little before they released that album. And uh, I, you know, I just, I, I didn't have, I hadn't heard him really. The first time I heard him was sitting on a living room floor in somebody's living room in, in Washington, D.C. at around eight in the morning when we played our first uh, notes together. Did you see something special right there? Oh, I, yeah, I heard something special. <laughs> I guess I saw something special, too. Tell, tell uh, me about that. Well, I, my um, my initial thought was Clarence is back. Because Clarence White, Tony Rice is the only uh, guitar player that it had a certain thing that uh, Clarence White uh, had, kind of... I guess syncopation or accurateness. There's something in his playing that reminded me of Clarence. I feel like, you know, when, when you talk about Tony Rice, he, his, his story is, is in popular knowledge divided into kind of two eras, right? Like pre making music with you, like when he was making music with Crow and he was doing the, the, the stuff with the scene and then kind of after that. So can you tell me a little bit about how Tony ended up finding himself uh, making those early records with you? Well, uh, that day that we met, uh, Tony asked what I was doing, and I happened to have a tape. I had had a band for a year at that time with Richard Green, the fiddle player. We, we had formed a band uh, called the Great American Music Band, um, and which sort of was a happenstance. We just got this sort of ended up playing some gigs together. Uh, he hired me for some gigs and I hired him for some gigs. And we, uh, after a few gigs, we, we decided to try to make a go of it just playing instrumental music. Because up until that time, you know, it, it, it was all about vocals in a bluegrass band. We were really bluegrass musicians. So, you know, we set our minds to uh, developing a format for playing instrumental music uh, with blue, essentially bluegrass instruments. Um, and what we realized we couldn't play... Uh, you know, 75 minutes of hoedown. So we, uh, you know, did some Django, Reinhardt, and Stefan Grappelli material, some Duke Ellington, some Bill, Bill Monroe. We got into arranging things, and my composing started sort of flourishing. I was, I had written some what you might call extended pieces, like Dog's Rag and uh, as soon as I as we established this format, I started the tunes started coming out. You know, had a reason for it. So uh, the morning I met Tony, uh, he had flown into Washington D.C. That's where the session was, and I I had come in the night before. And Bill Keith woke me up, got me out of bed. And you got to meet Tony Rice, you know. So and, and it was just like a house full of people, you know, somebody else's house. I can't remember whose house it was, but we just sat down on the floor and picked a tune or two. And then Tony asked me what I was doing. And I had a tape of this band, uh, which had just sort of dissolved because Richard Green uh, got hired by Loggins and Messina. And so the band was no longer, but I had made a tape, um, Owsley, uh, 
Stanley the Third, who recorded uh, "Old in the Way." I there with this great American music band had done a run at the boarding house where "Old in the Way" uh, played, and uh, I had him record, uh, you know, a few nights there, and I had put it into a made an album out of it, which still has never been released, but. I had a tape of this album, so uh, I guess somebody had a reel-to-reel -reel tape machine there, or maybe it was a cassette, I can't remember. Um, and he wanted to hear, I told him, you know, I had this band and he wanted to hear it. And uh, so I played this tape for him and his exact words, little X-rated, I'd give my left nut to play that music. And uh, he, he got real excited about it, and uh, he invited me and pretty much insisted that I go back to Lexington, Kentucky with him after this record was done and show him these tunes. And so I did and hung out with him for a few days in Lexington. Did you play? Did you play with Crow or anything? Yeah, they were playing in the Sheraton Inn there, and it was... Ricky, that's where I met Ricky Skaggs and JD. And uh, there's a tape that we made uh, one night there, but it was really kind of sad because I, it was during the week and maybe it was a lot better on weekends, but they played every night at this lounge in the Sheraton Inn. And it was like nobody there, like maybe three or four people, you know. And uh, it was just sad because by the second or third set, which I guess they were contracted to do, no matter how few people were there, they they would just start goofing off. And, you know, it was just, to me, like, here's the world's greatest bluegrass band, pretty much, in, in a lot of ways, and nobody's there, you know. And uh, so anyhow, uh, got to know Tony and you know, spent several days there just playing and showing him my tunes. And he was listening to nothing but jazz. He was listening to uh, Oscar Peterson and John Coltrane. And that's all he he was listening to, to my recollection. So, um, and then after I went back to California and by then I had, had a couple of disciples, uh, Todd Phillips, was in a mandolin class that I had, and um, the class, I left the music school that, you know, I, I was doing that in, and he was still taking a few lessons, and he was trading me mandolin bridges for lessons. He was very handy building things. In fact, he built a mandolin, and, uh, and one day he brought over his friend Daryl Anger, and the bass player from the Great American Music Band was a guy named Joe Carroll, who's like an older bebopper, uh, lived in Marin County. And he still, he really dug playing that music. So we just get together, uh, the four of us, no guitar player, and work. I, I kind of like the idea of having two mandolins and I had a lot of harmony parts that I was showing Todd. And... Uh, you know, like I said, he brought over Daryl, who had they had been fans of this great American music band, and Daryl had learned all these Richard Green solos. Um, and I told Tony, you know, I, I've got these young guys. Well, Joe Carroll was older, but the other guys were younger. And we're, you know, we work on this stuff. And um, he kept calling me from... Lexington, when's the gig? When's the gig? I said, what gig, you know? <laughs> Did he want to get out? Was he looking to get out? Uh, you know, I, that's all I remember. He didn't really say he wanted to get out or anything, but uh, so they were going to Japan. They had a tour in Japan, and they were going to play in a place called Paul's Saloon, which was in Bluegrass Club in San Francisco at the time. And I said, well, look, uh, why don't you come out a few days early and we'll do some playing, you know, because I didn't, uh, you know, I wasn't going to book a gig. You know, I thought back then you had to have money 
to have a band, you had to be able to pay to hire somebody for a gig. And I just wasn't that motivated at, at that point to start my own band. I just thought, saw it would be, you know, uh, I couldn't see it, you know, uh, although I had this concept and, you know, a repertoire and some, you know, essentially volunteers. And so Tony came out. We spent a few days playing, all of us. And then uh, he played the gig at Paul Saloon, and they went off to Japan. Well, at some point during the next week, the phone rings in my house about 3 in the morning, and it's Tony calling me from Japan, telling me he just quit JD. And he was going to move to California to play my music. Holy moly. I, and I never asked him to do that. You didn't even know you were going to put a band together. Yeah, you know, I like I said, I figured, well, I I have to be able to pay. I yeah. have, to, you know, I can't really have a. I can't ask this guy to. I mean, you, you know, I just a little older, and you know. <laughs> so does he? Does he fly out like the next? Yeah, when well, he drove. He and his wife just moved out. They moved into our basement for several months and then they got their own play and we started rehearsing. We rehearsed for about at least two months before we ever played a gig. And what, was I told, he, huh? what was he like? Like, was he, cause from what I understand, he wasn't, he was listening to a lot of Oscar Peterson. He would listen to a lot of Coltrane, but he wasn't yeah. playing it, you know, like. Well, he, you know, he, 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 he's the guitar genius, you know, he had his own thing and, you know, this wasn't really, jazz per se you know it was a, a lot of things it was you know tunes that i had written and they had elements of jazz and some of them elements of bluegrass and others some were you know and um he, you know he, he, he it was kind of like the missing link for him you know it, it, it he was ready I guess it was an idea whose time had come for a, for a lot of musicians uh, who who were really bluegrass musicians. That's where they, what they mainly did. But they heard other things. I never like I didn't want to ruin bluegrass, so I'm pretty much a traditional guy when it comes to bluegrass, and so is Tony. You know, but this, in fact, Tony named my band. He named this band. And uh, which I got to thank him for, you know. Uh, didn't you? Didn't you encourage him to to compose? Yeah. Well, that was another thing. At some point during those rehearsals, he said uh, he made a remark. I can't write tunes. I and I said, sure, you can write tunes. And the very next day, came in with Swing Fifty One. That was it. It was just, hey man, you can. He just needed. He needed someone to tell him that he could do it. I didn't, uh, yeah, I just said, that's the way I recall it. It's a long time ago, you know, but, I, you know, I remember him saying that, and I I said, yeah, what do you mean? You can write a tune. What a, what a thing for the first tune he comes in and says, I wrote this tune. Yeah. It turns out to be, like, a really killer track on your record. Yeah. You know, right. what now gets played by a lot of people, you know? Yeah. In fact, uh, for years, you know, uh, I can't, if I had a dollar for everybody that came up and said, you know, my favorite tune is, and it would invariably be one of Tony's tune, you know, some tune that I didn't write, you know, which used to piss me off, you know, slightly, but at least I figured, well, I, at least if I don't write it, I know a good tune when I hear one. You know? <laughs> so but, so you, yeah. you and Tony stuck, stuck it out for a while with the, with the uh, Crispin Quintet, right? Four years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, he he didn't want to tour with Stefan Grappelli. I came in one day and said, and I had been offered this three-week tour with Stefan, the whole United States, and my band would back him up. And so I came in to rehearsal and said, guess what? We're going to go, and, and Tony Rice immediately said, I'm not doing that. I came here to play Dog's Rag, not Sweet Georgia Brown. So his exact words. And at the time, uh, 
you know, Tony was a powerful force in my band. And we didn't always see eye to eye on every last thing. And he was so, I, I kind of think of it, and maybe I'm totally off on this because I don't really know, but I think of sort of like what must have been the dynamic between Benny Goodman and Gene Krupa. It's like, you know, he could, he was so strong that he could take that band where he wanted to. I mean, temp, little things like tempos and stuff. And we had little disagreements, but Tony would always say, you know, if we get into an argument, I'd, I'd say, kidding, you know, I'll fire you. And you'd say, you can't fire me. I'll just show up at the next gig. <laughs> you, you and Tony, yeah, I know you, you probably had some problems after that, but you, you guys stayed in touch, you know, you, you guys. Oh, yeah, we loved each other. And, yeah. and uh, I, it was never uh, on the, sur- We you know, it, I think he was kind of pissed that, you know, uh, he wasn't in the band anymore, but he, you know, he sort of, <laughs> I didn't think I could ever fire him. Not that I really would want to, but, you know, by that time he and Mike and Daryl and Todd were playing little gigs as a quartet. And, uh, and then Tony, you know, he made a, an album kind of like mine, an, an instrumental album with, uh, which started writing tunes. He realized he could. And, and, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Ricky Skaggs and Buck White had come out, and Buck called me up from the studio and said, he said, there's a robbery going on here. I said, what do you mean? He said, and Tony was playing, was recording his first instrumental album, and they thought he was stealing my, he said, they're stealing my music. I said, you know, hey, I appreciate that, but you know, you can't can't keep a good idea down. So that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to do exactly that, and Tony Rice always did exactly what he wanted to do. When, when did you guys last talk? Uh, you know, I don't think we actually talked. You know, it was sometime maybe three years ago because you know he. he pretty much uh, cut himself off from all his friends, even his brothers. And uh, the the way you could communicate was text. But the last text I had, and I may have talked to him since then, but I kind of doubt it. He came to a gig of of my bluegrass band in around 2015 and just showed up. Uh, And uh, he left during the he didn't stay for the whole gig, but uh, I hugged him. It was like hugging a, a skeleton. What, what, what was he like, dog? Like, what was what was Tony? You know, uh, he's one of the true enigmas to me, you know. But he was he was a great guy, you know. He was a very unusual character, and very dedicated to his craft, and very. Uh, you know, very op- opinionated about certain things. And it was kind of no m- middle ground for him. It was either the greatest or, as he put it, the reekinist. <laughs> the, the, the reekinist? Yeah, like yeah. it reeks. You know? Yeah, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> what, what made his playing so special? Well, the... You know, nobody could tune a guitar better than that. Or uh, there was a certain accuracy that was just uh, a certain precision. Like, uh, and a certain warmth. You know, he just had a very unique thing. And uh, he he did it great, but, you know, you... uh, he had all the ingredients, like we used to talk about the three T's, uh, time, tone, and taste. Yeah. And we all have lapses of taste, probably. Uh, because any virtuoso probably goes too far sometimes. With, like, the music, 
sometimes come, and I'm not saying accusing Tony of this, but sometimes it's like, look what I can do, as opposed to expressing something that's not that. Yeah, the clear, the clearest of that is when, on the Dog and Tea record, Tony does a solo Shenandoah, which he did a lot in, in a lot yeah. of his concerts. And that, to me, is the three T's right there. It mm -hmm. never steps over the line of being, um, you know, sh show offy, you know. Yeah, right. No, he 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 wasn't that. He, you know, I, you know, uh, musicians become very critical, you know, be, and mostly of themselves. Um, but you have to be critical in order in order to uh, advance. You know, you have to realize where what your weaknesses are and work on them you know I mean, maybe some musicians don't don't have weaknesses i'm not one of those guys um uh, mm -hmm. let me let me close things out th this way and you've been really generous um you know when you when you think of tony your buddy tony in your in your mind's eye right just paint me a picture of, of what you see when you see tony rice well i i you know i have to go back to you know the time you know years ago, which, I don't know, she was a gentle, um, just beautiful soul, you know, that unfortunately had a lot of tragedy in his life. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I guess his biography is called Still Inside. He kept a lot of things inside. And uh, he... I don't know if he realized how much his friends loved him because he kind of, you know, pushed him away or, or just didn't, he just was uncommunicative. And I can't, I mean, that's the way he wanted it, I, you know. But I would get texts from him, don't give up on me, I, you know. I, you know, he, he's a beautiful soul, you know, and he experienced He had a great gift. He did, man. He did. I'll miss him. I can tell, but, man. You know, uh, that's what happens. If it doesn't happen to you, it happens to your friends. So uh, he made a great contribution. And, you know, his music will live forever as long as there's a planet. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the comfort, Hank. Like that, that, that impact is there forever. You know, yeah. that's, never, that's never dying. You and, know? you know, I, I certainly was a lucky guy that he <laughs> moved into my basement and played my music. And in some ways that, that will never be equal. Dog, thank you so much, man. Thank you. I can't thank you enough. Really appreciate it. Well, I am so grateful as as you can probably hear for david's time and, and for sharing some of those stories that, that means the world to me thank you so much to david thank you so much to jerry douglas thank you so much to sam bush um our next episode will be bela fleck sharon gilchrist peter rowan and josh williams all people who toured and performed and recorded with tony rice toy heart is produced by stephanie coleman and me tom power our executive producer is amy right now jacobs with help as always from the entire bgs team including producer chris jacobs associate editor justin hiltner managing editor craig shelburne and all of the amazing writers and contributors that make bgs the best source for roots culture redefined you can discover more at the bluegrass situation.com the show was mixed by stephanie coleman transcription by rob mclaren our theme song is toy heart by bill monroe performed by chris L. 
Eldridge and Kristen Andreessen. If this is your first time listening, you can hear full interviews with folks like Del McCurry, Alice Gerard, and Jesse McReynolds in the podcast feed. Click subscribe and tell any friends of yours that are into bluegrass music. And we'll see you next week for part two of our tribute to Tony Rice. Later on. Thank you.